So, hey, I want to start off by just thanking everyone who made uh, today's service possible. I, I really appreciate the worship team. The worship team does such an amazing job every single time. And uh, I w- really want to thank Wiley and Kristen for doing uh, just a fantastic job with the special music. Thank you so much for that, guys. Really, really, really appreciate that. That was beautiful. Uh, um, Jim and Leah, thank you for bringing the food again today. Uh, hope you got, yes, <laughs> amen. Uh, be sure to stick around for that. I don't, when is the precipitation supposed to start? It's not supposed to start today, right? So we're in no hurry to. Texas, we don't know. Oh, we, <laughs> it's Texas, we don't know. That's right. Welcome to, do what? 1 a.m.? Okay. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> well, hey, I uh, want to welcome everybody who's streaming and uh, anybody who's going to watch this later. I uh, really um, hope that uh, today's message will bless you. So the last time that I was here, we were talking about how uh, the spring holy days, Passover, you know, would be taking, you know, the, the Lord's Supper, would be taking the symbols, the, the, uh, the bread and the wine. And we we're talking about how those symbols picture Jesus, right? And we were talking about how, so, how it's so important for us to make sure that when we take these symbols that picture Jesus, that we do not take those symbols in an unworthy manner. So one of the things that was uh, important for us to talk about was, do we love Jesus? Do we love him in the manner that he really and truly deserves? And one of the things that we talked about was, you know, is it possible for us in this day and age to really love Jesus like he said? Because Jesus said, if you don't love him more than than your own parents, than your own children, which is so hard to even comprehend. If you don't love him more than that, then you're not worthy of him. And so we talked about how is it possible that we could have that love? How can we love Jesus like that? And he gave us a clue. And if you want to, uh, if you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. We're talking about how we could love Jesus like he really deserves And one of the things that we brought up was this story of Jesus when he was invited over to Simon the Pharisee's house. Remember that? And you remember what happened, that Jesus was at Simon's house, and they're having their dinner. And while they're eating, this woman who was called a sinner, a sinful woman, shows up. And she walks up behind Jesus, and she just kneels down, and she begins weeping just crying over his feet. And she begins to wash his feet with her very tears. And we've talked about how, can you just imagine, imagine what that would have looked like and how that would have, that would have probably been revolting to Simon the Pharisee. And then Jesus gave him this little story. So in Luke chapter 7, verse 41, just in review of what we talked about, Jesus said to Simon, he said, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. So here's a guy who loaned money to two different people. One he owed, well, we'll just say in today's terms, 50 bucks. And to another guy, we'll say 50 million. So he loans these two people, 50 bucks to one, 50 million to the other. And then the guy's feel, feeling generous, the guy who loaned the money, and he, and he decides to forgive both of them of what they owed. And so Jesus asked Simon, he says, so tell me, this is in verse 42, which of them will love him the most? So who's going to love this guy the most? The guy who loaned the money? The guy who is, you know, who was forgiven of a $50 debt? Is he going to love this guy as much as the guy who was forgiven of $50 million? And, of course, we know humanly, right? We know humanly the guy who's forgiven a $50 million is going to love so much more. So we were talking about how important it is that we understand the magnitude of our rescue. Because if we understand how much Jesus has saved us, then we will love him more. So today I want to kind of dig into that a little bit more. So the title of today's message is Magnitude 
of rescue. Before we get started, though, I would like to pray. So, Heavenly Father, here we are to worship you and to read your words, these very words of life that you have given to us, that you have preserved throughout the ages. And we're so thankful to you for them. Father, we're going to read through these, and we're going to honor, and we're going to lift up your son, Jesus. And today, Father, I just pray that you would pour out your spirit on us. One of the main reasons, great God, is that we want, everyone in this room wants to love your son more than what we really do right now, to be honest. We want to love him more. We want to love him in a worthy manner. Oh, Father, open our, our eyes to see how beautiful your son is and help us to understand what he has saved us from. To really appreciate this gift, Lord. What we have been, what we have been saved from, great God, but also the incredible future that you have given to us through your son. And that can only happen through your spirit, the, your very mind working in our lives. And we ask, so, so we, Lord, we just ask that you would show up in a powerful way today. We know wherever two or more are gathered together in your name that you're there, Jesus. We welcome you here now. We pray that you'll be honored. So, Father, we just turn this message over to you. Every word, Lord, may it be of you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So how much value do we put? How much value do we put on the rescue that Jesus has given to us? We talked about last time that you can imagine that like if, if I was standing on, or I'll say you, say you're standing on the last step of some stairs, right? So you're like eight inches from the floor. And if you jump, and I'm standing there, and as your feet are like just a couple of inches from the ground, I reach out and grab you and slowly let you down, you wouldn't think I'd saved you of anything, right? Because really, I hadn't. There was no risk of you dying from that. But if you had accidentally fallen from the Empire State Building, and you're hurtling down towards the sidewalk without any way of being rescued, and I reached out from one of the windows and pulled you in, well, then that's a whole different story, isn't it? Now you're thinking, oh, I love this guy. And it doesn't take any, anybody to talk you into it. It's just automatic. Oh, I love this guy because he saved me from such a terrible fate. So it's just automatic, right? So let's talk about what we've been rescued from. I want you to imagine for a moment. Imagine for a moment that Jesus did not die for you 2,000 years ago. Imagine that right now that there is no sacrifice to cover your sins. That right now you're in your sins. Nothing has, has not, there's been no atonement, no covering for that. Think about for, for a moment, how would you feel right now knowing that you were still in your sins and knowing what that would do to your relationship with God? What would, what would your destiny be if it were not for Christ? What did Jesus save us from? So that's the question that I'm posing here at the beginning. Again, to help us to try to realize the magnitude of what it is that Jesus saved us from, we have to talk about what it is. What was that fate? What was that destiny that was ours before we were saved? So if you would, let's turn over to John chapter 3. We're going to read some passages that, frankly... I don't like to read very often because they're a little scary. And they shouldn't be. I mean, for a Christian, these verses should not be scary because this is not the end result for us. 
But when you think about what it could have meant, what it could have been, what the end could have been. So I want to just kind of quickly read through these verses. And at the end, I'm going to ask you, based on what the Bible says, not my opinion, what was it that Jesus saved us from? Okay, so in John chapter 3, in verse 36, these are Jesus' words, okay? So the Son of God says, He who believes in the Son... Now I'm going to have to pause here for a second. Is this Jesus saying this, or is this John the Baptist? Somebody help me out here. John it's John the Baptist, isn't it? No, Sorry. No, I, yep, thank you. Thank you. I knew it as soon as I said that. Nope, that's not Jesus. This is John the Baptist. Sorry, guys. Uh, you can burn me at the stake later. All right, so uh, John the Baptist. Yes, that's right, because John the Baptist here was baptizing people, and he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to him, right? And so he, wanted, he had a little word with them, and he said to them, He who believes in the Son, who, he who believes in Jesus, has everlasting life. But the person who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. So a person who does not believe in Jesus has the wrath of God on them. It's not something that we talk about very often, is it? But I'd like to ask you guys, what is the wrath of God? Does anyone know? I'm opening up the floor. What is the, the wrath of God? Any thoughts? Nobody wants to talk about wrath of God, do they? Judgment. Yes. His anger. I mean, what's wrath, right? Yeah. It's, it's not a good thing, is it? Those people who do not believe in Jesus, it says here that the wrath of God abides on them. Now, it's interesting. He says that the wrath of God abides. So the word abide just means remains, right? So he's saying that it remains. So it's there to start with. So how did, how did we earn this? How did, how did we get this wrath of God assigned to us in the first place? How is it that it, that it abides on us? How, how was it assigned to us? What did we do? We sinned, right? And the wages of sin is death. That's right. So we earned it. We did it to ourselves. We earned it. So without Jesus, this wrath, this eternal death, rests on us. Let's turn over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 18. Sorry, guys, this is not the most optimistic part. I guarantee you it does get better. But if we're going to understand, you know, sometimes, like, you've got to explain to people, if you do this or if you go down this path, here's what the end result is going to be. You need to know. And for us, I think sometimes after, you know, we have been saved from this, we kind of forget after a while, you know? It, it, we kind of purge it from our mind, and we forget about how much Jesus has saved us from. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against who? The, the Christians? Is, is there wrath of God on Christians? It says here that it's against everyone who commits ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, if you'll go into Romans chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 5. Here, Paul, talking to the church in Rome, has this to say. He says, in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart. Now, impenitent is not really one of those words that we use a lot today. But what does impenitent mean? Yeah, somebody who does not have repentance. So here's a person who is hard in their heart towards God, and they will not confess their sins. So they, they have not repented. He says, because of your hardness and, and your unrepentant heart, you are treasuring, or maybe your translation says you're storing up for yourself what? Wrath. 
Because of your heart that's so cold and hard and unrepentant, you're storing up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath. There is a day of wrath coming, a day of revelation of the righteous judgment of God. There is judgment coming for those who don't have Jesus as their Savior. That's what we've been saved from. Now, he says that God will, in this day of judgment, he says he will render to each one according to his deeds. Verse 7, he says, For those who, by patient continuance in doing good, now that's you guys, that's Oakstone. I love, that's one of the things that I love about this congregation, is how you guys love to do good. I think Adam even gave a message about how we're supposed to do good works. You know, faith without works is dead. And, and you guys just have a natural desire, it seems like. Um, and it's so cool because, like, uh, we were um, streaming and watching you guys when the announcement was made about those uh, blessing bags. And my daughter, Emily, she was sitting beside me. And, and, you know, when they talked about that, she perked up. And she was like, yeah, that sounds really cool. We need to get involved in that. And I think sometimes the younger you know, generation, they're like, hey, let's, you know, let's do something with this faith. Let's not just sit around and talk about it. Let's actually go out and do something. So here in Romans, he's saying that there's this one group of people. They are doing good. And they seek for glory and honor. And I believe this is talking about God. You know, these are a group of people who want to glorify God in their lives, want to honor Him. And they're looking for immortality. They're looking forward to an eternal life with God. This is what's in their heart, and they're excited about that. And for that group of people, for that group, Paul says, they get eternal life. But then in verse 8, for those who are self-seeking, so those who are selfish, and do not obey the truth. Sorry, I forgot to set my timer. Don't want to go too long. Don't want to get snowed in here. All right. So, uh, for, yeah, right. We got food, right? It'll last for a little bit. Or maybe it'll be like Survivor. <laughs> All right. So for those who are self-seeking and do not want to obey the truth, but they obey what? Unrighteousness. And I've got to be honest, there was a time in my life, man, that was talking about me. That's what I was seeking. I was seeking unrighteousness. I was seeking to break all the rules. I wanted to do the wrong things because you know what? Here's a little secret. Sin feels good a lot of times. Sin feels really good at first. <laughs> and then, you know, you reap the harvest, right? I used to say, you know... Uh, you know, what, what is it? Um, a, person, a person reaps what they sow, right? Lord, please grant me crop failure. Give me crop failure. God's all the seeds that I planted that were not good back then. So he says, now here's a group of people who you can tell what their heart is, right? They are set on doing the wrong thing. Now, what, what do they get? Now, the group we talked about earlier, they get eternal life. But for this other group who don't want to do what's right, they get indignation and wrath. Now, that's what New King James says, indignation and wrath. Does your translation say something different? Wrath and fury, right? Wrath and indignation. So I was, I was noticing that these translations, they kind of like move the, like wrath is at the beginning or it's the second word and all that. So I thought I'll go into the Greek and see what these words actually mean. So the first word that in the New King James is uh, translated as indignation, it's a Greek word that talks about a kind of a slowly building anger, a kind that just starts small and swells and builds and builds, all right? So if you have kids, you know that kind of indignation, right? Where they push that button, mommy. Mommy, 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 mommy. And it just starts swelling, it's building, it's building. Okay, some of you are smiling. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? And then there's the other Greek word, the other one, 
for wrath or uh, uh, fury was some of the translation for some of you guys. Now, this is an explosive anger, right? And some of you have experienced that too, right? When you push mom just a little too far, when you push that button just one time too many, right? And the next thing you know, you're being chased around the house by a wild woman with a wood spoon in her hand, right? And for some of you, it wasn't the mom who was the disciplinarian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sometimes it wasn't a wood spoon. It was just whatever she could grab, you know? Uh, for some of you, though, it was the dad. The dad was the disciplinarian, right? And I bet you can still remember that sound when his belt would come through those belt loops. It sounded like a 50 caliber machine gun. Pop, 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 pop as it came out, right? That's the other kind of wrath. So that's what these people are storing up. They are storing up this fury, this wrath, this indignation from God. He also says, verse, uh, I guess it's verse 9, yes. Not only do they get this indignation and wrath, but there's also tribulation and anguish. It's not a pleasant thing. For the man who does evil, first the Jew, but also the Greek. We don't want to be in that group, right? But that is what Jesus saves us from. There is a day he was talking about here in Romans 2. There is, in verse 5, a day of wrath. So I just want to look briefly at some scriptures in your favorite book, Revelation, that talk about this day of wrath, okay? So let's go first to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, and we'll start in verse 15. Now, there are uh, you know, many more verses about the wrath of God in the New Testament. I will not cover them all today. I think probably just this little brief little overview is enough to, to remind us of uh, what God has saved us from. So what does this day of wrath look like This in the future? Is it a pleasant thing? Is it just a little wrap on the wrist and say, okay, you're, you're good, you're out of here? So Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, here it's talking about, here comes Jesus back to the earth. King of kings and Lord of lords and judgment is his to, to rule, to, to dispense over men. And it says the kings of the earth, how do they respond when they see Jesus? The kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, these mighty men, these stout guys, man, every slave and every free man, they hid themselves. Hid themselves. They hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from what? The wrath of the Lamb. And it's just amazing to me that for us here in this room, the return of Jesus is such a happy thing. We're like, yes, bring it. Oh, Jesus, I can't wait to see you face to face. I can't wait to see my Savior. I can't wait to have that personal one-on-one -on -one fellowship with you. I'm looking for, I mean, for most of us, hopefully all of us, to see Jesus coming through the clouds is going to be so awesome. It's so, such a happy day for us. It's so hard to believe that there's a group of people who will see Christ return and they will be scared to death because they know what's coming, right? Turn over to 14, chapter 14 of Revelation. Chapter 14 and verse 9. We're getting closer. Chapter 14, verse 9 talking about those who worship this beast image. It says, anyone who worships the beast and his image, he receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand. Now, I'll just make a little comment here. You'll hear people sometimes say, well, what is the mark of the beast? Is it 666? And is it, you know, getting immunized for COVID-19? There's all these different things. You know, people are like, what is the mark of the beast? Because they're so afraid of getting this mark of the beast, they don't want to be on the wrong side. But what I see here is that the, the people who get this mark of the beast, 
is people who worship the beast in his image. So those of us who worship God, who worship Jesus, I don't think we have anything to worry about. We're not going to fall into this trap because we're not worshiping the beast. So anyway, so for those people who do worship the beast, who are not worshiping Jesus, what happens to them? Verse 10, it says, He himself, these people who have this mark, he himself will drink of the wine of what? Of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. There's that word again, indignation. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. You think about what has Jesus saved us from? What would be our, what would be our end? All right, one last, one last scripture in this part. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. Anyone not found, Revelation 20, 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We'll stop there. And the church said, thank you. <laughs> right? It's, it's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult to read those verses, even though you know that it doesn't apply to you. It's still like, whew. it's kind of like watching that video of um, the car accident from Fort Worth. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen it. I, I haven't watched it, but I've heard you know, several of you talk about it. Even though it does not affect me personally, just the very thought of it turns my stomach, right? The very thought that there will be people who will turn against God and be so hardened in their hearts. It's still tough to think about. So what did Jesus save us from? We just read all these verses. What did Jesus save us from? From ourselves. Amen. Amen. And what was that punishment going to be? Was it, was it just a little, you know, jump off of the, the bottom step of some stairs? Or was it that fall from the Empire State Building? You know, it was total and complete destruction, right? That's what Jesus saved us from. How does that make you feel? I want to pause just for a second. If there's anybody here who would like to share anything, if that triggered any thoughts before I move on to the next part, I just want to give you an opportunity to say something. Mm-hmm. My Bible showed me in uh, Luke 6, 20, uh, 30, 30, 30, to make no stone of him, and, and the women were upset about what would happen to Jesus. It was in a prophecy about all that. About the stones falling? Yeah, yeah. Not pleasant. Not pleasant. All right? I, I just finished this now. Okay. Appreciate it. So let's think about this. So. What Jesus did for us, though, was twofold. And this is something I really want to focus on in this last part. Not only did Jesus save us from a terrible end, not only did he just save us, but he also did more than that. He delivered us. He delivered us from, like, the worst possible fate, and he took us to the best possible fate. He didn't just leave us. He didn't just say, okay, you're saved. You're free to go. And I think I've mentioned this here before, but what it makes me think of is if you can imagine for a moment that you were on death row. I know some of you guys are probably thinking, man, he is really negative today. First, he says, think about if Jesus didn't die for you, and then he's, he's pushing me off the Empire State Building, and now he's, okay, but think about this for a second. Imagine that you were on death row. And just before, just before they put the lethal injection in, the phone rings on the wall. The warden goes over there and picks it up, and it's the governor. And the governor says, you're free. You're free to go. Your life has been spared. You're free. The warden hands you your street clothes. You get dressed. 
And then you walk to the, the door to walk outside the prison, and the warden meets you there, and he hands you an envelope. You open up the envelope. There's some keys inside, and there's a letter. You take the letter out, and the letter is from the governor. And the governor says, not only have I freed you from the death penalty, not only are you free from that and free to go, but on the other side of this door is a $200,000 Lamborghini. It's yours. The keys in this envelope are for you. In the glove box, you will see the title, and it has your name on it. It's yours. Also, if you'll open the trunk of the car, you'll see a suitcase in there. In that suitcase is a million dollars. It's all yours. Also, in that suitcase are some keys to a mansion. It's a multi-million dollar mansion. It's right beside mine. It's right there by the governor's mansion. The deed to that house is in your name. It's all yours. Once you walk through that door, this reward is all for you. And that is what Jesus has done for us. So when we think about it, do we love him? How do we, how do we appreciate him? It takes, it takes two things, I think. I think it, like Jesus was talking about, we have to appreciate the debt that we've been forgiven but also we have to think about what he has given to us. So let's spend some time now thinking about that, okay? Let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Aren't you guys glad that we're about to shift gears into something a little more positive? Amen? All right. I am too, actually. I love thinking about what God has in store for us. I think the Bible says we can't even imagine the things that he has in store. Sometimes... Um, Elaine and I were talking about that, and, and I'll say, I think of it like, like we like to go to Disney, right? Like to go to Disney World down in Florida. And you can just imagine trying to explain to someone from a third world country, if you were going to take someone from a third world country and take them to Disney World, trying to explain to them what a roller coaster is. You know, trying to explain what the whole concept of this park is beyond their ability to understand. And I think what lies ahead of us is so wonderful, and we can't even wrap our minds around it. But I know it's going to be awesome. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, and we get to enjoy that, of course, all because of what Christ did for us. So here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10, Paul is praising the church in Thessalonica. And Paul says this, to the church. He says, here you are, you're waiting for his son from heaven. That's what we're doing as well. We're waiting for his son, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. I think about like how UPS delivers. You know, he grabbed us. He picked us up and he delivered us to a new address. And the truth is, is that it had to be Jesus. He delivers us from wrath. Was there anyone else who could have done that? Could, could we in any way? Was there anything that we could do that, would, that, would, that God would just say, okay, you're worthy. I'm going to cover this wrath. Was there any amount of money that we could have paid? Even if we were worth as much as Jeff Bezos, which is what, like $150 billion with a B? It's just incredible. Even if you had $150 billion, would God take that and say, okay, you can have eternal life? Was there anyone that we could call on who would be able to stand in in our stead and be able to take the rap for us? No. Only Jesus, not Confucius, not Buddha, not Muhammad. Jesus was the only one who could deliver us from the wrath to come. So 2 Corinthians now, let's take a look at another verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And again, I'm trying to just build this case that we should really appreciate what Christ has done, what, is, what our Savior has done for us. Not only has he saved us from this wrath to come, but he has also prepared a future for us that is just amazing. And our love for him should just be beyond compare. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 Simple verse, but it says, he, For he made him who knew no sin 
to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He took the, the sin that was ours, and he took it upon himself. Two things about that that's just amazing. First of all, that he being perfectly holy and having never sinned in his life was willing to take all of our sin upon him so that we would be righteous in God's eyes. All of that sin was laid on him. I just can't imagine. But also so that he could take that wrath that was due to us so that he would take it. I think a lot of us here probably have friends who are very dear to us. I think the Bible says that there's a friend who's closer than a brother. I bet right now in your mind you can think about who this person might be. Someone who is so close and dear to you. And the expression that we use a lot of times is, I would take a bullet for that person. I would take a bullet for that person because I love them so much. And here's Jesus who took a bullet for us. He was willing to, like in the military, you'll hear stories about guys who will like jump on a grenade so that they can take the full impact of that explosion so that their buddies are saved. Jesus was willing to take the full fury of his father so that we wouldn't have to. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. This time I'm pretty sure this is Jesus speaking. John chapter 5 and verse 24. The very Son of God said these words. He says, most assuredly, most assuredly. Now, whenever you see this, most assuredly, Jesus is trying to be as emphatic as possible. These are words that are certain. These are words that are positive, absolute, guaranteed. You can take these words to the bank. So Jesus says, most assuredly, yours may say truly, truly, or verily, verily. This is the truth. I'm saying this to you. He who hears my word, if we hear the words that Jesus has for us, and if we believe in him who sent Jesus, believe in him who sent me, Jesus said, you have everlasting life, and you shall not come into judgment, but you have passed from death into life. We should be rejoicing over this. Church, we have passed from death into life. We don't have to worry about that wrath anymore. Now, the Bible does say that it is possible, and I think I mentioned this once before too, that I... Believe in once saved, always saved, and I don't believe in once saved, always saved in this regard. That technically, it is possible for a person, after they are saved, once they have tasted that heavenly gift, it says, the Bible says if they turn their back on that, then there remains no more sacrifice for them. And so those pe- it, is, it is technically possible, but who in their right mind Once you remember what you were saved from and you think about what lies ahead, who in their right mind would turn their back on that? I mean, it's like, I wish Jessica was here because we talked about this one time. What's your, what would be one place that you would really, really love to go to? And Jessica said, y'all remember? Jupiter. (laughs) That's the one place she really, really wants to go. But probably for most of us in the room right now, If someone offered us to go to the Bahamas this week and get out of this snowstorm, would you not be all excited or or whatever your favorite vacation spot would be? But now imagine, here you are, that you've been taken there, dropped off, you're at this beautiful location, and then the guy, whoever it is that takes you there, says to you, well, you're free to go at any time. 
If you ever decide that you don't want this tropical paradise and you want to go back and freeze in Dallas, you're free to, right? You have free will. But who would do that? That's what I'm thinking. So most assuredly, whoever hears my word and believes in me, he has he will first, he will not come into judgment, but he has passed from death into life. Now, let's go over just to, uh, across the page to John chapter 6. Again, Jesus speaking. John 6, 47. Jesus, he starts off again with this phrase, most assuredly. So here's another statement that you can believe. The Son of God says this. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who, has, who believes in me has ever lasting life. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you have everlasting life? You know, I think it's powerful to actually confirm these things with your mouth. So if you want to, say it out loud. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. And do you believe that you have eternal life? Yes. 100%. Verse 48, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And when we take those symbols here in six weeks, we'll be taking this bread. And, and we should remember, Jesus is the bread of life. He said, you know what? Your fathers, they ate that man in the wilderness, that bread that came down from heaven for the ancient Israelites. But they're all dead now. He said, but me though, he said, this is the bread that comes down from heaven and whoever eats of it will not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. It says in verse 51, he will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh and I give it for the life of the world. He offers it to all mankind. Now let's turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. Romans wasn't just about wrath. Romans talks about what Jesus did to save us from that wrath. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For when we were still without strength. Now think about this. Before we accepted Christ. When we were out without strength. And I like how some of the other translations put this. So like the NIV says, when we were still powerless. We were talking about that earlier. Did we have the power within ourselves? Can you be good enough to save yourself? No. When we were still weak, ESV says. New Living Translation says, when we were utterly helpless. In due time, or in the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. He swoops in, and he saves us from ourselves, like Miranda was saying. Verse 7, for scarcely, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. Someone might take a bullet, someone may jump on a grenade. But God demonstrated his love for us, that in while we were still sinners, we weren't worth it. We were sinners. We were thumbing our noses at God. God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So much more than, Paul says, now catch this, verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from what? What does your Bible say? wrath. We shall be saved through him. A peace accord was signed by the very blood of our Savior. He says, when we were enemies, God was willing to save us then. How much more now? Verse 10, if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, so while we were enemies, when we came to Christ and said, Jesus, forgive me. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me. 
I want you to be my Savior. I want all of my sins to be covered by your blood. It says, if we were enemies and we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be, shall we, future tense, be saved by his life? How is that? Now, what, what, what do you think he's trying to say here? He's saying that when you were enemies, God was willing to save you. But he's saying now that you're reconciled, now that you're right with God, he said, how much more will you be saved? What's he saying here? Was it a one time only? When you were baptized, he washed you clean of your sins. But then the first time you sinned after that, it was over with? No. Let's turn to Hebrews. Because you see... Jesus lives. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Here's the beautiful news. And this needs to be proclaimed because when I talk to people in churches all over, I'll ask them sometimes, I'll say, if Jesus were to return right now, if Jesus were to return right now, how sure are you that you would be changed in the twinkling of an eye? How sure are you, as the scripture says, that you would rise to meet your Savior in the air? And I have been kind of amazed. Christians who've been going to church for decades, and they say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm good enough. I'm not sure if I have qualified. And I really want to erase that, okay? Okay. Because look at what it says here in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. It says, therefore, he is able to save, save from what? We talked about that in Romans, save us from the wrath of God. Therefore, he's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He is able to save to the uttermost. What does that mean? To the uttermost. What, can, what comes into your mind when you think of he's able to save you to the uttermost? Limitless, absolutely. Some of the, some of the uh, other translations, other words uh, th that could be used there for uh, uh, uttermost are thoroughly. He saves you thoroughly. He is able to save you completely. Nothing outstanding. Why do you think it was so important for the writer of Hebrews to give us that message? Because do you think our enemy wants to plant seeds of doubt? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if God can forgive me of that sin. Here I am. I accepted Jesus as my Savior, but I'm not sure if Jesus' blood is powerful enough to cover that sin. And the writer of Hebrews says, he is able to save you to the uttermost. Everything erased. As far as the east is from the west, Jesus saves us from our sins. He is able to save us to the uttermost. Those who come to God through him, through Jesus, because he always lives to make intercession. What does it mean to make intercession? Jesus is there at the right hand of the Father, constantly, daily, making intercession intercession, to intervene on our behalf, to plead our case before the Father. Let's turn back to Romans for a second. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. You see, we do have an enemy who's constantly trying to condemn us, constantly trying to make us feel like we're, we should still be guilty, like Jesus wasn't able to save us from ourselves. But in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Paul says, who is it that condemns? Who can put a charge against you? Who condemns you? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, he's risen. He didn't just die one time and that was it. He's now at the right hand of God. And he makes intercession for us, constantly covering our sins. And then our last passage. And all the kids said, thank you. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Oh, this is a scripture that should just make us jump up and down for joy. Church, there is therefore now no condemnation. How much condemnation? No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Does this cause you to love Jesus more? Does this make you appreciate his sacrifice more? I mean, no longer any condemnation, but not just that. Eternal joy. To be able to to fellowship with God. An eternity that is so wonderful we can't even imagine. Does the sheer magnitude of this rescue drive you to love him more and to appreciate his sacrifice more? So in these coming weeks, as we prepare to take those symbols of Jesus' sacrifice, I want to encourage us. I'd like to encourage us to think about the magnitude of our rescue, to think about what Jesus saved you from, and then also consider the magnitude of his sacrifice, what Jesus was willing to endure on our behalf because he loves us, and to remember that God did love us so much that he sent his son for us so that we could have a wonderful future. So my hope, church, my hope is that as we meditate on the things that we've talked about here today, meditate on what we've been saved from, think about what our future holds. My hope is that our appreciation for Jesus increases, our love for him will deepen, and you know, our appreciation for his sacrifice will grow. Amen? All right, well, be sure to stick around for the potluck. Uh, and also, be sure to minister to one another. If you get a chance to, you know, we all have been gifted by God to be able to minister to one another. If anyone needs prayers, please do not leave here today without having one of us pray with you. Anyone in this room would be happy to pray for you. And if you haven't had a chance to meet my beautiful wife and daughter, please go over there and say hi to them. And guys, again, I know I say it every time, but I just love you guys so much, and I really appreciate you all, and I pray that God blesses the the remainder of this week, and that um, it will not turn out, the weather will not turn out quite as bad as they say, and even if it does, that God will take care of all of your needs. Amen. God bless y'all.